Okay, hello again. So far in the series, we have uh, had a look at the principle uh, generally behind the standard setting. We also had a look at some of the most famous absolute methods of a standard setting. And in this video, we are going to look at the relative methods. Um, now, unlike the absolute methods, which they were normally uh, were based on individual performance in relative methods uh, we look at the group of examinees as a whole and we deal with uh, a lot of uh, normalized curves in general now some of the most famous one I've listened them here and I would be going through each of those one by one to give you an insight of how these methods work. Now Cohen is probably one of the uh, simplest and cheapest of the relative methods to do and the way it worked is um, if you had a normalized distribution curve as you can see here in the picture and then you pick the 95 percentile of the curve and we say okay then so whoever that candidate is uh, we're just gonna give that person 100% and anybody above also 100% and then uh, Cohen suggested that you just take an arbitrary number and she picked 60% uh, from the score of that person and just go down the curve and wherever that cutoff point is is going to be your um, pass mark so coin is very simple, it's very cheap to do uh, and uh, the next one down the line in terms of simplicity uh, is the Wynane. Now the Wynane method is also using a normalized distribution curve as you can see here. So what essentially you have to do is you have to calculate the mean um, of the curve as well as uh, a standard error of measurement uh, which uh, I'm not going to go through any of the details of how this measurement is done but uh, in summary this is a reflection of the reliability of uh, that particular examination so uh, two times the standard error of measurement and you just find out where on the curve that kind of line sits uh, obviously not that interested on uh, the right hand side of the mean because the score goes higher so your interest would be on the left hand side of the mean and wherever that cutoff point is would be your pass mark for that particular examination uh, the next method is called the contrasting group and uh, this requires a slightly different approach to the way an examination is set um, in general. So just imagine we've got uh, an ASCII examination and then you as an examiner you will be marking candidates and let's say uh, for the sake of simplicity that the ASCII station has got only three items which you have to mark. Uh, however, there are some ASCII uh, examinations which uh, as part of the standard setting you have to design a sort of global rating within that. So imagine as an examiner you're asked to give very very objective markings on those three items which I initially mentioned. However, regardless of whatever mark you give, you have to make a professional judgment whether that candidate is a pass candidate, a clear fail candidate, or a borderline candidate. And absolutely regardless of whatever uh, marks or scores they get uh, through your objective items, uh, you just give uh, that global marking as well. Mm -hmm. So then what happens is from all the uh, scores given to those who have been considered pass, you can draw um, a sort of subcategory curve as you can see on the on, on the picture here on down below. And also you draw uh, another curve of those people's uh, score who have failed. So these two curves of failure and pass will intersect at a point. And then if you draw a line, uh, from that intersection into your main graph that will hit the score line somewhere down that line which you can just arbitrarily see and that is going to be your pass score. Uh, 
Uh, there's also another method called the borderline regression method, which same the same sort of uses the same principle. So imagine you are again back at that ASCII station with three items, and you're giving your objective marks as an examiner. However, you're also asked to do a global judgment of the examinee. So whether they are a clear pass, a clear fail, or a borderline pass or a borderline failure candidate. Now the key about borderline regression is uh, you have to have a number of um, possibilities for your global marking. So four is really actually the sort of the minimum. Some people even put like distinction or um, clear pass uh, as a fifth kind of actually item in their global marking. Now let's say we've got four because that's what we would be using in Manchester as well. So the way it works is then uh, you put these uh, fail, borderline, fail, borderline, pass and pass global markings um, on your graph as well and then you will uh, plot uh, all the marks given to the candidates who failed the station and also you plot all the marks given to the borderline fail and you, so on you give uh, or you plot uh, all the borderline pass candidate marks as well as all the uh, candidates who passed are plotted and then you simply just draw a regression line um, to go through these four categories and the way it works is then wherever your borderline fail is uh, that will uh, correspond to a mark uh, on the y-axis and that would be your uh, pass a score for that given ASCII station uh, so here we have covered uh, some of the most famous relative methods of a standard setting. Now, you might say, okay, so uh, we have covered some absolute and some relative methods and they each had their own individual advantages and disadvantages. And uh, some of the educationalists, they have combined um, the methods of absolute and the relative in order to come into a third category called the compromised methods of standard setting, uh, which is essentially a combination of the two. And the most famous uh, of, of these compromised methods is the Hofstede one, which I would be quickly going through. Now, if you've ever been asked to judge in a Hofstede system, you should be able to answer these four questions. The first question would be in your mind, what would be a pass a score above which pretty much all the candidates will always pass the exam regardless of how easy or how difficult the exam is? The second question would be in your mind, what is the pass a score below which pretty much you know, one will always fail regardless of how difficult or how easy the exam is? The third question would be in a given exam, what is the lowest acceptable failure rate you expect uh, or you suspect that might happen? And the fourth question would be, what is the highest acceptable failure rate for that exam? Now, let's imagine you are a panel of four judges and you're asked for the first question, so what's the minimum pass a score and you're each given a score, so we calculate the mean and the mean is, say, for example, in this given example, 64%. Uh, for the question of what's the maximum passive score above which everybody will pretty much pass, um, each four of you have given their own opinions and then uh, the average is shown there. Uh, same for the minimum failure rate of the exam and again the same for the maximum failure rate of the exam. So then you've got a graph and then on the x axis you've got the test score up to 100 percent and also on the y-axis you've got a failure rate. So we'll, let's draw uh, four lines to correspond to the four questions we just asked earlier on. So we've got the minimum pass score just drawn on, on the uh, graph and then you've got the maximum passing the score. Uh, same for the minimum failure rate it's drawn here and also we've got the maximum failure rate that the panel of judges agreed on. And then you have to draw the cumulative test score of that particular exam. 
Now, from the four lines which you drew earlier on, if you intersect them like this, that will cross to your test score curves in a given point, and that given point will correspond somewhere on the x-axis, which is a test score, and whatever test score that corresponds to would be your pass mark. Um, here's a list of reading if you are interested to uh, know a little bit more about the uh, methods covered so far. Um, I hope you found these very uh, useful.